Bless you. In the name of Jesus. I'm just going to pray a little more, add on to what Sam was just praying. Holy Spirit, I pray uh, against a spirit of delusion in any form in this place. In Jesus' name, in fact, I dispatch angels in the name of Jesus to apprehend any spirits that carry any form of delusion and uh, apprehend them, take them out of here in the name of Jesus. I pray, Holy Spirit, would you release clarity in the atmosphere right now? Would you open heaven? Just release a lot of clarity in the room. I'm just praying for us to even feel the air being clearer. I just thank you that there have been different times in this room that uh, we sense things happening. We, some, we, sometimes we smell you, Jesus, and sometimes we see like a little bit of haziness, like your glory. I'm just asking right now, just a, a supernatural, tangible experience of a lot of clarity in the air, like being on top of a mountain. I'm asking for eyes like fire, that we'd see clear. I bind a spirit of sleep in Jesus' name. I bind a spirit of slumber. I command it out of here in Jesus' name. you got no legal claim here. Nobody wants you here. you got to go in Jesus' name. I pray, Holy Spirit, would you just breathe the breath of life on us right now? Just make us alive, vibrant, alert. We just say, we do not want to be like those sleeping bridesmaids. We just tell you, we you know where we're at. We want to be awake. We want to be alert. We want to be clear. And we just say to you, Lord, it feels like the night is falling a little bit, and we don't want to get tired driving. So we just pray. Just wake us up. Just roll a little wind on our faces, Lord. We just roll down the window by our desire. You said, just release a little bit of wind on our faces. Cool us off a little bit. Clear the air. It's on fire right now. We're made to be alive. We're made to be vibrant. We're not made to be dull, tired, worn out, confused. We're not made to be confused. I bind the spirit of confusion right now in Jesus' name. Yeah, just give us clarity, more clarity. I just feel like the Lord's saying a couple people are tingling right now. Just, uh, just tell them thank you. Ask them for more. He just wants to give you more clarity. You don't have to even do it out loud. Just whisper to them. Thank you. Ask them for more. It's sometimes the Lord highlights us just by like letting us feel a little bit. And that's just him saying, this is something I'm doing for you right now. There's more available. So we just thank you, Jesus. We thank you for what you're willing to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so today I want to talk about end time delusion. And this is something that I actually teach about from time to time. I really like teaching about it. And um, I just felt strongly that this was a word for today. So I appreciated Sam actually praying that in, um, yeah, it was really uh, just confirmed it for me. Okay, so I have some notes. You probably don't have the notes. I put them online. If you um, are the kind of person that like needs notes just to be able to follow along, you can find them online. Don't worry about not having them because I don't know how closely I'm going to follow the notes. And I'll post notes or print them for you if you want them um, if you let me know after the after the message if you're like oh you said some stuff i couldn't follow it that well i want those notes will you print them for me i will and i'll kind of edit them to um, more closely reflect what i'm gonna talk about because i have like five pages of notes and i'll never get through it all today okay so i want to talk about something that is touching the earth right now and it has been touching the earth for a while and it's promised to increase which is delusion and delusion, the danger with delusion is that you don't know when it's happening. There's some chemicals. I work in the environmental services field, and there are some chemicals that are incredibly dangerous because as soon as you get a whiff of them, your sensitivity to them completely disappears, and you no longer are sensitive to the fact that they're happening. And they, like, affect your ability to perceive them, and they can kill you because you can't detect them anymore. Delusion is like this. You start to taste it, suddenly you don't realize it. That's why it's delusion. You don't recognize how deeply deceived you're becoming. And so the only way to resist delusion is to understand it, believe the warnings about it, and actually start going in the opposite direction, which is into truth. Now, the truth of the, of the, the Bible, the truth of Jesus, the truth of the end times, it is painful to the flesh. That's the whole point. 
The whole point is that we're supposed to die because we didn't want to wait. We, through Adam and Eve, did not want to wait for God to lead us into the truth of good and evil. So because of that, the cost of that is the lack of his leadership, which is death. There is no life apart from God. Like his, he's like the sun, we're like trees. If we took the sun away from any of these trees, it would not be long and they would die. The only reason that we're deluded into thinking that that might not be the case, that we might be able to live kind of deciding about God, is his patience. That's it. That's the only reason that people that aren't fully submitted to his leadership are still alive is because of his patience. Because the truth is, he will not take second place. He will not arbitrate with a man. He does not compromise at all. Zero compromise. And so he's given the earth time to decide, do I want to live? And these are the requirements for living that I would submit to his leadership fully. Do I want that? Or would I rather take my chances on another leader? Because there's only one way this works. We're created. He's uncreated. There's a big difference. He's infinitely different than we are. Does that make sense? And so the enemy's plan is to get the earth as deluded as possible. Now, it's not really just the enemy's plan. God lets the enemy lie. The enemy's created as well. There's only one uncreated God. There's only one holy other than. There's only one the seraphim and the angels are declaring holy, holy, holy about. So the, the, one of the main lines of delusion happening right now in the planet is that I'm, this is a message to the church, okay? So let's just put out of our minds the world. Jesus said that judgment starts in the house of God, and then it's going to touch the world. And the reason for that is because we're supposed to be agents of judging. We're supposed to be agents of judgment. So if judgment is going to the world, the agents of it have to be true in their ability to speak truth in, in love and judgment to the world. So judgment, this is a message to the church is kind of my point. Now, the main delusion in the church right now is that the earth is having a conflict of good versus evil. It's not what's happening. In fact, the conflict of good versus evil, it happens about a thousand years from now. In the end, at the end of the millennial reign, that's when evil is going to be wiped out by good. Right now, that's not what's happening. Right now, the conflict is truth versus untruth. There's a big difference between the difference between good versus evil and truth versus deception. And so we have to get a hold of the fact that we're not looking for good to overcome evil because we don't really know what good is. That's the problem. We don't that that was what happened at the fall with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve said, "We think we can figure out good from evil. We'll eat that tree, the knowledge of the good and evil, and then we'll kind of put God out of the equation because we're not going to listen to his leadership. Don't eat that tree." And as soon as Adam and Eve did that, delusion started to operate in their minds about the difference between good and evil. So Jesus paid that we could get clear on that. But we have to choose to get clear on that. And so the enemy's deception is good versus evil. The knowledge of, I'm sorry, the knowledge of good and evil. We have to, the, the enemy tries to get us to, to fight that battle apart from the truth of what's good and evil. I may have messed up the way that I said that. Are you following me? So we need to get clear on truth before we can do the good and evil part. That's what I'm trying to say. The fall in the garden, the fall was, it brought mankind into a lack of knowledge of good and evil because mankind broke the leadership of good. Jesus said there's only one good one, the Father. He's the only one good. Okay, so actually come with me. Let's start there. Let's go to uh, Mark 10, 17 to 21. You're going to need a Bible today because I got notes. That doesn't mean you get to uh, pass on reading Bible verses. So I'll give you a chance to look it up. This is important to see. Now, knowing God means knowing his leadership as it confronts false standards of good. That's what the whole earth is kind of wrestling with right now, are false standards of good. And we have to decide that we're willing to submit to what God says is good. God's the only source of good. His, the absence of his leadership, that's what evil is. So the misconception in the world is that there's this force called evil, kind of led by Satan and his team, and then there's this force called good, led by God and his team, and we know the end of the story. It works out. Good's going to win, and so we start to look all over the earth. Where is good winning? That is a deception. It's a delusion. That's not the way that it works. 
The evil is not a force. That's why. Evil, it's like light and dark. Dark is not anything. It's the absence of light. Evil is not anything. It's the absence of good. It's the absence of his leadership. So it's guaranteed that evil is going to be out, blown out by good. Because a tiny, itty-bitty LED light in the greatest darkness outside defeats the darkness where that light is. It doesn't take very much light to defeat darkness. What we're doing right now is we're deciding, do we want to be with the light or do we want to be with the darkness? And it's easy to start looking at the world and see good versus evil and start picking a side. And what you'll find out is if you do that, you're picking darkness. Jesus is coming from the, the truth is coming. So we want to be picking truth. And truth looks different than the world defines good. Okay, that's the problem. That's why the earth missed Jesus mostly. And even right now, a lot of the church is missing Jesus because delusion is increasing. Okay, so Mark 10, 17 to 21. Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. And then he starts to talk to him about the expression of knowing God. He starts to talk to this rich young ruler about what would actually happen if you know God. Okay, and so he says, you know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal. He, what he's saying is, is God your leader? Are you doing these things? Do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. Now Jesus knows this. He's drawing him into a greater depth of reality. Then Jesus says, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, give to the poor, you'll have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. He said, yeah, you do it, but you're not doing everything. You haven't given him everything. That's the truth. It looks good to do the stuff, but the truth is the stuff is not enough. It's got to be everything, and that will produce the stuff. So we have, to, we have to get to the point where we're willing to say, I'll take you on your terms. I'm not going to give myself time to figure out how much I want you. I'm taking you on your terms all the way as much as I can today, and I'm pressing that it's more tomorrow. This is what red hot love looks like. This is why Jesus looks at Laodicea and says, you're lukewarm. You're actually taking me on your terms. You're taking me, yes. You're probably doing more than the people you know. But are you taking me on my terms? Because my terms are wholehearted, burning love, giving up everything for you, everything. Laying down my kingdom, laying down my divine privilege so that you could be with me. Are you wanting to be equally yoked in that? That's truth. Now that looks like death in many ways. Good, according to God, in many ways is going to look like our death and the death of people around us. Are we willing to come to him on his terms? Now that I'm talking in kind of spiritual generalities, but when you start making this real, it's painful. And it's supposed to be. He said, unless you take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. So we need help doing this. We actually need to talk to him about how this works. This is what, what we do night and day prayer for is that we have a night and day problem. Okay, now, Isaiah 55, 6 to 9. Turn there with me, if you will, please. Isaiah 55, 6 to 9. Now, Satan, he could quote these passages. Satan uses Bible verses to rationalize rebellion. That's every way that every time the dragon speaks, he uses Bible verses generally out of context, usually with a very slight mixture, just enough to get us to cast off God's leadership and try to do the good thing. So when you think about Satan tempting Jesus in the, in the desert, he says, you're the son of man. Take these stones, turn them into bread. Now, this was part of Jesus' destiny was to, to turn stuff into food, like more food, to increase food. It sounded like a good thing. It sounded like something that Jesus, it's part of his identity. But it wasn't under God's leadership. And he takes him up on the top. He shows him all the kingdoms of the earth. Jesus is supposed to actually get all the kingdoms of the earth. In fact, he did. But Satan twists it just a little bit. Says, you can, there's a shortcut. You can do it my way. Do it right now. Why are you waiting? You know how many people are going to die between now and 2,000 years from now? Do it my way. I'll give it to you right now. Wouldn't we say that in a fallen human nature that that'd be better for like not 2,000 years of trouble to happen on the earth? Why don't we just get this thing over with and start everything being good right now? But Jesus said, no, that's not the Father's leadership. That's different. 
There's a difference between good and what you're saying. Even though it appeals to the flesh, the flesh is deluded. The flesh is broken. The flesh don't know. So the, the question right now is, how do I get clear on truth so that when it's time, I can agree with good versus evil? The time for good versus evil is at the end of the millennial reign. Right now is the time for truth. Does that make sense? Okay. Isaiah 55, 6 to 9. Seek the Lord while he may be found. This is a time-sensitive instruction. There, time is going to run out for this. We've got to be really clear about this. Time is going to run out to get truth. Why? Because the hand of the restrainer, 2 Thessalonians 2, is being released. So anywhere you don't want to hear the truth, anywhere the truth starts to annoy you, and you don't say, God, problems me, not you. I want to hear truth. I'm willing to do what I can to agree with it. Any place you're not willing to do that, you're guaranteed to start thinking that your truth is the truth. The one that is rebelling against God, you'll start to seem like this is what God is saying. People that kill other people in the name of God will do so thinking they're serving God. That's what Jesus told his disciples in John 16. He says they'll kill you and they'll think they're offering God a service. They'll really believe it. It's not like they'll go to bed at night and be like, oh, man, I wish I would have killed those guys. They wake up in the morning, kind of ramp themselves up. They'll literally go to bed thinking, this was so righteous, the murder that I did today. So righteous. This has happened numerous times. Nazi Germany, Rwanda, I mean, in the last 20 years. It's happening right now in very minor ways, relatively minor ways here. Across the earth, it's happening in much more major ways. It's coming here. The trouble is, if the church doesn't repent and start getting into the mindset that we don't know good, when it comes here, it'll be worse than any other place it's ever been. It says in, in the Bible, it says that the end time Babylon is filled with the blood of the saints, filled with it. Now, we don't have to be worried about that. We don't have to be afraid about it. Perfect love casts out all fear. We have to get true about it. We have to get clear about it. And we have to respond to it. We got to come out. That's the instruction in Revelation 18. Come out of the world. And it takes some effort to come out. In fact, the instruction in Revelation 18 is don't just come out, mix double for the world. Well, if, if he's telling us to mix double, that means we've got to kind of stir something up. Isaiah said, no one stirs themselves up to take hold of you. Our righteousness is like filthy rags. No one stirs themselves up. It's actually a sacrifice of praise. We get into the, the humility of saying there is something tragically wrong happening all around me, and I don't feel it, I'm going to do something to try and get myself into the place. That's why we fast. All that fasting is, is emptying ourselves of some comfort so we can feel a little bit bad to touch the reality that all creation is growing. That's the point of fasting. That's the point of praying. On the front end, praying looks ridiculously weak and pretty boring. But when we give the sacrifice of praise, we give the sacrifice of prayer, the sacrifice of thanksgiving, all of a sudden we start to find out, oh, it's a sacrifice that actually gets me much more. We've got to get ourselves to the point where we're willing to say, I'm willing to do some some different stuff because the earth is in a different time. It is. I mean, I don't need to convince you of that, right? If you think the earth is in a different time, just raise your hand for a second. So I know we're all on the same page. Thank you. Isaiah 55, 69, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. That means that at some point he's going to get more distant. The end times are great and terrible. They're light and darkness. He's going to remove himself from places that don't want his leadership. For real. Deep darkness is going to cover the land, but a rise and shine, a light is also going to come up at the same time. And you're picking it right now. Like, you're picking it right now. If you're like, oh, I I like kind of a little bit of darkness. Darkness and light, the two can't operate together. They don't stand together. He's too bright. So you got to decide all the way. Well, Tom, I'm not that great at like doing light all the way. That's right. You're not. That's why we pray. That's why we ask him. That's why we seek him. That's why we knock. If we take the truth with those one way that we can know it's true, it starts to change us. The The truth works. His word does not return void. That means it can't get sown in any way and not start to bear some fruit. So if we're spending our time in meetings, if we're just real practically, if we're spending our time in meetings, we're spending our time like doing churchy stuff and we're not changing on the inside, we are deluded. It's not working. 
You should be able to measurably say, I feel differently about my sin this week than I did two weeks ago. If you can't do that, you're on the wrong road, for real. And you should be able to look forward and say, I've got a ways to go. That's, that's true. If we, don't, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, he's faithful to forgive. So we're not who we're going to be, but we shouldn't be who we were. Does that make sense? We're going in a direction. The kingdom is a direction. It's not like right now, it's not a destination. We're heading there. We're working out our salvation is the point. This is really important. Okay, so he says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. What God is saying is you don't know. You've got to forsake your ways and pick up mine. Well, yours look really intense, God, and nobody else seems to really care about it that much. They say that they're doing your way, but they're really doing everybody else's way. In fact, they're trying to kind of water down your way so that the world will receive it. And what God would say is they're deluded. Don't fall in with them. You've got to come out all the way out. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now Joshua 5, 13 to 14. Will you turn there with me, please? Joshua 5, 13 to 14. Whose side is God on? What's that? You answered. Go ahead. Our side? Let's turn to Joshua 5, 13 to 14. I love any man brave enough to answer. I love that man. That's why I said that. You there? Joshua 5, 13 to 14. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho. Now, we have to remember this story. They've just come out of the wilderness, 40 years of testing, 40 years of trial. The, most of the generation that came out of Egypt walked through the Red Sea, pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, leading the manna in the desert, water from the rock. Most of them are dead, told they would never step foot in this land. God is so committed to the Israelites that the other nations are terrified of them. They heard rumors of what's been happening as they've wandered through the desert. They've heard rumors of what's been happening to the nations that resisted them. They're terrified of them. This is, what, this is what happens at Jericho. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? Can you imagine the angel of God, like an, a mighty angel, a warring angel? And Joshua, like the leader of the Israelites, all the other nations are terrified of him. He walks up to him. Can you see the prophetic people of our hour, the false prophets, like they'd be taking selfies. They'd be like, he's for us. We win. This is it. We are the guys. He's showing up for us. Let's take the land. And Joshua asked a simple question. Are you for us or our adversaries? This is the answer. No. What? Well, who are you for? You're for the good guys, right? No. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Is God against ISIS? Did he make the people that make up ISIS? Absolutely. Does he believe in a destiny for them that's good? Absolutely, because he's good. Are we good? The answer is no. We are not good. In ourselves, we are not good. In him, we're the righteousness of God. In ourselves, not good. In him, the righteousness of God. Well, how much in him? All the way. That's how we get to be the righteousness of God. All the way in. Well, how much all the way? Because I still make some mistakes. All though, As far as you can be in him today. What about tomorrow? As far as you can be in him tomorrow. What about the next day? But I don't really want to change. I'm good. I'm like saved. I'm good. I'm better than everybody else I know. You're not in him. Do you see what I'm saying? all the way in, as much as you can today. Seek the Lord now while there's time. Forsake your ways. He's coming. He's judging this place right now. It's going to get way, way worse. And we have got to decide whom we are going to serve. Like, we have to, not as a group. Individually, we have to decide. 
How long am I going to keep you at arm's length? Because you're running out of time. And the danger in it is you're going to start to think he's not at arm's length. That's dangerous, real dangerous, because he's going to kill people that think that they are in agreement with him. Matthew 7, they're going to prophesy my name, cast out demons in my name, heal the sick in my name, and I'm going to say, I never knew you. They were deluded. They thought the whole time because they were saying his name that they were in his leadership. It's delusion. He's talking about us. He's talking about people like us, people that sit in churches. We've got to decide that we're going to go all the way into him as much as we can, and then he'll start erasing the delusion from our hearts. We'll get more and more clear. This is what it means to climb his holy mountain. We get clean hands and a pure heart, but we've got to have a direction. We've got to have a, a, a place that we're going to in righteousness in him. It's the only way it works, and it's easy to know this language and not be moving. It's very easy to preach the language and not be doing the moving. The moving stinks. It really does. It's effort. It's not even really work, but it, it, you know this if you've ever been oppressed by a spirit and you're like, I feel miserable. I feel miserable. All you have to do is cry out. That's all, that's all you got to do. I don't want to feel this depression anymore. Depression, go in the name of Jesus. You go through the spin cycle. You go through the rinse cycle. You keep doing it until you break through. All you're really doing is talking, which you're doing anyway, but it takes some real doing to do it. You've got to do some real doing in your life right now. It's, all, it's just asking, but you must do it. You must, all the way in, as much as you can be. I'm sorry that this gospel is generally not preached, but it is true, and it's the only one in the Bible. As commander of the Lord, I've now come. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Do you know what the angel said to Joshua? I want you to take Jericho, and I want you to do it in worship. Circle the city. I mean, I assume that that's what the angel told him because that's the last thing you hear. Next thing you know, all these Israelites are doing the weirdest plan to take Jericho, going around the city shouting. And then this angel and his armies take the city. That's what we're doing here. Do you believe that this place is going to get overrun by people that hate Jesus and hate you and that if you're not all the way in his leadership, you're dangerously dangling from the outside of his kingdom. You ever watch predator videos where lions like, Arr! they don't go to the center and get the strongest one. They get the ones that are barely in the group, the ones that kind of fall out the sides. He's the center. We get in the center, we are safe. This is the only way it works. All of creation, it displays his majesty. This is simple. The world isn't in a conflict between good and evil because it is no contest. Darkness cannot withstand even the smallest light. God's light, his glory, will cover the earth. It's no question. Habakkuk 2, 13 to 14. Will you turn there with me, please? Habakkuk 2, 13 to 14. Behold, it is not of the Lord of hosts that the peoples labor to feed the fire. And the nations weary themselves in vain. That's what's happening right now. The nations are wearying themselves, and the Lord says it's in vain. There's no, there's no fruit that's going to come out of the negotiations that the nations are in right now, the threatening of war that the nations are doing right now, the plans for economic prosperity that the nations are engaging in right now, the plans for health care that the nations are engaging in right now, the plans for climate change. There's zero fruit, and it's in vain. They're feeding the fire. Yes, they're doing something. They're working hard, but it's in vain. He says, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The reality is that the world is in conflict between truth and deception. As we choose truth, it begins to dis displace deception. Turn with me for a second to Daniel 10. This is important to go there. I'll stay there for a minute. As we choose truth, it starts to displace deception. It's the only way it works. If we stay where we're at, if we just kind of like, I got enough truth, I'm pretty good then we are actually inviting deception to kind of hang out and speak to us. In the third year of Cyrus, verse 1, the king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long, and he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food. Why? Was he out of pleasant food? No. He wanted truth. He was un-okay with where the nation was. 
He's one of the most righteous men in Babylon in the captivity, but was unokay to be separated. In fact, if you look, his testimony is, I prayed three times a day and I faced Jerusalem. I was unokay that the throne of the Lord that David had built was not there. I was unokay about it. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all. Three whole weeks were fulfilled. Three whole weeks were fulfilled. Now on the 24th day, on the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man, clothed with linen, whose waist was girded with the gold of Uphaz. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire. Does this sound familiar? A certain man? His arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them. Do you see that even in this passage, we see a difference between somebody ready to see truth and somebody not ready to see truth? I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them. They felt the vision. They didn't see it so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore, I was left alone, and I saw this great vision, and no strength remained into me, for my vigor was turned to frailty in me, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. Suddenly, a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you, and stand upright, for I now have been sent to you. Now, while he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, the first day you set your heart for truth. You're like, the truth is missing from my being, and I must touch it. He says, as soon as you did that, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. What are your words? Are you desperate? Are you desperate to touch truth? You need to be, because the world is desperately going in the wrong direction right now. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief priests, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I've come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. And when he spoke such words to me, I turned my face to the ground and the ground and became speechless. And suddenly, one having the likeness of the sons of men, touched my lips and then opened my mouth. I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to him who stood before me, My Lord, because of the vision, my sorrows have overwhelmed me, and I have retained no strength. For how can the servant of my Lord talk with you, my Lord? As for me, no strength remains in me now, nor is any breath left in me. Then again, the one having the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me. Do you see that there's a dialogue happening here? These are not wasted words. These are not flowery, poetic words. Daniel's like, barely responding. He's like, I am barely responding. And the angel's like, more. Are we telling him that? I am barely responding so that we could be strengthened to get more. This is the only way it works. If Daniel hadn't, hadn't have given himself up, opened his heart, they would have stood there looking at one another. Because God's not going to violate who you are or what you want in your heart in order to give you the truth that will save your life. He won't. Even salvation you had to pick. The most important choice in a, in a being's moment, you had to voluntarily pick. Then again, the one having the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me. He said, oh man, greatly beloved, fear not, peace be to you. Be strong, yes, be strong. He's answering all the things that Daniel just told him. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak for you have strengthened me. Let my Lord speak. This glorious, glorious man, this certain man, eyes like fire, feet like brass, the same man on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter falls down and says, it is good that we are here. Let's never leave. Daniel says, go ahead and talk now. Are we reaching for him to tell us things? Are we giving him permission to speak to our hearts? Because if we just wait, this is the point. If we just wait and do nothing and think, I'm doing the stuff everybody else is doing, but we're not doing any internal reach for truth, we are getting delusion. Then he said, do you know why I've come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. These are, these are demons that are resisting the truth coming forward. But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of, everybody say it, truth. 
The reality is that the world is in a conflict between truth and deception. 2 Timothy 4, 3 to 8. Will you turn there with me for a second? As we choose truth, it begins to displace deception. That's what Daniel was doing. He was choosing truth, and truth is a man. His name is Jesus. Jesus and his armies began to displace armies that were opposed to him, angels that were opposed to him. They didn't start displacing until Daniel started talking. And when Daniel started talking, Daniel got weak. Daniel got frail. When Jesus showed up, it wasn't that glorious moment of breakthrough. Let's do the selfie. We are winning. It was I don't have anything left to even talk to you. Do you see what I'm saying? There is delusion, strong delusion in the church right now. Massive delusion. And most of us, if you're like me, we are a mixture between like what is good and what is bad. That's wrong. That's really not going to help you. What is true? I don't really need anybody else to tell me what's true except for Jesus and his word. And then I come with the other people, and I say what is true. And if other people are saying what is true, maybe it's something I haven't heard before. I'm like, yeah, my spirit says that's true. The word says that's true. That's true. But I know enough about this thing to know the difference. And I know enough about this thing to know when somebody's twisting it just a little bit and taking me away from the humility and the death that is his leadership so that I could get resurrected with him. This is not confusing. In reality, it's only confusing to deluded people that are surrounded by lukewarm. That's it. We've got to come out. We must. It's life or death. It really is. It's life or death that we would get ourselves uncomfortable and come out. And that means that we got to do something. We actually have to give him something to work with because he loves us. He will not violate us. Now, as we choose deception, we're given more. Our ears are naturally inclined in the church to want deception. We actually will celebrate deception, feel good about it, feel the spirit moving, and miss the entire point. It happens all the time. All the time. Most of the time. 2 Timothy 4, 3 to 8. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. He's talking about people sitting in pews. and Nobody else is really looking for any doctrine at all. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Don't be confused when this happens. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. He's saying, I'm the first fruits. That's what he said. Uh, Sarah quoted it today. He said, I'm the first fruits. I got, I got the first fruits of the Spirit. I'm already being poured out. What do you think is going to happen? This is what Jesus said. He says, if they do this when the wood is green, what do you think they're going to do when it's dry? That, you know what, what he said that to? He said that to women that were mourning the pain that he was in right now. He's like, don't mourn for me. Mourn for you and your offspring. He's not who we think he is in many ways. He's different. I'm saying that about me. He's not who I think I am or who, he, who I think he is. I've got to humble myself and be like, you're something different than I would call good right now. Because I look at the seals, the trumpets, and the bulls, and I have a hard time seeing that as good. Or I look at the way that he deals with the world. And, I, and the, the clamor in the world is, if he's God, then where is the good? So i got to start here. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. He's talking about endurance. He's talking about mo movement. He's not even talking about it. I just kind of stayed in it. He says, I ran. I ran. I went further the next day than I did the day before. And then the next day I went further. How did he do that? Do you see what Paul says about the way that he was building churches? He said to, in several churches, I, I'll get it wrong if I try to quote it. I pray for you night and day. He says, the widows... Don't turn them out. They can pray night and day. He was all about night and day prayer. If you just search the phrase night and day or day and night, you're going to find that Paul said many times that that's the way that he ran. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me also, only, but also all who have loved his appearing. Loved it. All the parts of it. He, said, he didn't say this because, like, just good people love his appearing and bad people don't. He said this because it is hard to love his appearing. That's why the Spirit and the Bride say, even so, come. Even so what? Even so, it's really terrible, but we're saying, come anyway. 
Come anyway. It's great and terrible. Come anyway. When Ezekiel eats the scroll, when John gets the book, he says, eat it. It's going to be sweet in your mouth, but it is bitter in the stomach. It's going to turn your stomach sour. Even so, come. The pill is what's going to fix it. Now, this is a, let's, let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 to 12. It's right next to 2 Timothy. Or in the same range. Teaser are all together. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, when the lawless one is revealed to people who are deluded and in deception, they're going to more and more think, he's the lawful one. He seems good. He's doing what the Bible says. Well, yeah, except for outside of the leadership of God, you've put a few twists in there. Yeah, he's doing what the Bible says, but you get clear on what the Bible's actually talking about, humility, submission, waiting on the Lord, night and day prayer. There's not one, there's not one in the government that I hear proclaiming night and day prayer. Not one. Are you going to recognize it? Or are you looking for the good guys and the bad guys in the government? Most of us are looking for the good guys, but I, me, me included. I want to celebrate the good guys. I want to, you know, be the bad guys. Just think about all the movies, all the westerns, all the, you know, the, the cowboys in white, the bad guys in black. We've been conditioned to look for good and evil. It's the fall. The devil is trying to get us to keep eating the fruit. I want truth. I just felt the spirit on that. Did you feel the spirit on that? We got to come out. Well, I just, I love those old westerns. You know, they're better than, you know, the crap the kids watch nowadays. <laughs> they're not, they're just as deluded and deceiving as everything else. We got to get raw. We got to get real with him. The Bible tells us how to do that. We fast, we pray, we spend time circling his throne. It's boring, it's lame, it feels awful until you get into it. And then you're like, this is what I was made for. But if you don't feel that, you're not in it. If you don't feel like this is what I was made for, I love you. I care about you forever. You're just not in it. That's all. Tell him that you're not in it. It's not you're bad and that's why you don't like it. It's you're just not in it. You just haven't tasted it. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You taste and see the Lord is good, guaranteed. So if you're not feeling like this is fun and exciting and enjoyable, welcome to humanity. But don't stay there because humanity is going to hell. For real. We all feel that way. And some of us are like, I'm not okay with that. I'm willing to do something to get out of that. Those are the ones he's calling. He's calling everybody. Some let him call them. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 to 12. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. That's the Holy Spirit. That's a capital H on he. If it's not capital in your Bible, there's a footnote that says it could be. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of what was coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. God is going to help believers who don't love the truth, believe Satan is good. Let's say that one more time. God is going to help believers who don't love the truth, believe Satan is good. This is in the Bible. This is not my imagination. Now, how do I know that? Well, A, because it's a, it's a letter to the church at Thessalonica, A. B, they didn't receive a love of the truth. That means that they were exposed to the truth that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion. The world is already under strong delusion. It's already going to hell. So for God to send strong delusion, it means that you're getting something that you didn't have already. You see what I'm saying? This is a message to believers. We have to love the truth. This is hard to do. This is really hard to do. Unbelievers are already under strong delusion going to hell. Believers are the ones who look for signs. See, it says it's by the lying signs, powers, and wonders. Unbelievers aren't really looking for, where are the good signs? You know, they don't show up at meetings. They're like, hey, is anybody healing anybody here? Anybody prophesying here? Unbelievers don't care about any of that. It's with unrighteous signs, powers, and lying wonders. They heard the truth, but they wouldn't love it. When we love the truth called Jesus, Jesus is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. When we love Jesus, it does something. What does it do? It produces 
fruit. It actually produces something that we call works. Everybody say works. Okay, turn with me to James 2, 17 to 26. Stay with me. You guys with me? We're almost done. Right now, strong delusion. 1 Corinthians 13 says that even in the best circumstances, even with the most clarity ever, we see dimly, as in a mirror dimly. In ancient times, a, deer, a mirror was like a chunk of metal. You polish it up as good as you could, and you could kind of tell if the part was the right way or if you had some junk on your face, but you weren't getting like the crystal clear image that you're getting right now. The technology of mirrors that we have right now, like 200 AD is about when that started. And so we got to understand that this is describing seeing something like not quite clear. And he says, we see dimly as in a mirror. And then he says that prophecy is going to fail. He says that we're supposed to know that in the time that Jesus appears, we'll see him as we're seeing. And we'll get to that passage in a second. I'm slaughtering it. So let's go back to James. James 2, 17 to 26. Don't let me off the hook on that one because I did just kill that. Okay. Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It's not real. It's not living. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. So the, the reason I'm saying it like this is because if you want to know what's true, what is it doing? Is it active? Is it working? Because we see dimly, because we prophesy in part, we can't go by Oh, I see that that is factually true by the news or by it happened here because somebody told me it happened here. In fact, the enemy is going to hijack all media at some point in time. At some point in time, the news is going to be entirely lying. I think it's mostly there now, don't you? And there's no unbiased journalism anymore. It's like a joke. And so how do we know what's true? Like if there's delusion in the world, God's giving strong delusion to people, there's deception, we can know by fruit, know a tree by its fruit. So is the word changing who I am? Is the prophetic word that was spoken, is the understanding of the Bible being taught, is the one that I'm hearing changing who I am inside? Is it making me want to reach further tomorrow than I did yesterday? If it is, it's true. Well, Factually, it's not all, I don't see how it all lines up. Well, you know what? There's a, it's a big, big earth, and there's like a very small percentage reporting, and the vast majority of them have a bias and want to influence you in a very certain way. I learned this because last year on May 22nd, I claimed that rivers in Missouri and uh, the Missouri River and the Mississippi River are going to flood. And on May 22nd in my church, I got to stand up and preach a message about a wave that was going to break, and you got to get in the right position. And then I went home, and there was no flood. There was nothing in the news about a flood, zero things in the news about a flood. And at my house, it was sunny, and I'm looking at the radar in, in Missouri, and it's sunny, and I'm like, that word was wrong. I better get out there and start repenting and apologize. I am, maybe I am a false prophet. I really said that. I really thought that. Samantha knows. And I, I so dis, despair, like so distraught. David and Stephanie Kine know, too, because I had lunch with them. All of my good stories start with, I had lunch with David Kine. And he encouraged me in some way. All of my good stories of, of late. So I'm working out, and the Lord's like, will you die with me in this for three days? Just die with me in it for three days. This is on Sunday. I'm like, I don't even get that. He says, die with me in it for three days. Now, I realized later that Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy, and it looked like a complete train wreck of a prophecy when he died. He's like, three days later, everything changed. So I had no choice. Is either quit Jesus or listen to him and die in it for three days. And, you know, I'm kind of like, am I just giving myself a lifeline to stay sane? And that's okay. I want to stay sane. I'll take the lifeline. So I get to work the next day. I have lunch with the kinds. And David and Stephanie, like, didn't tell me that I was a false prophet or, you know, didn't get mad at me. They just said, well, you know, let's, let's just believe in the Lord for it. Let's just believe for it. So I got to my office after lunch. And, uh, I'm like, you know, there's, I'm a scientist. Like, I can't believe I didn't even think of this before, but there's all these hydrographs. Like, every river in the country has these, like, little meters that, you know, several places on the river. There's one in Comstock, actually, on the Kalamazoo River, and it tells you, like, what the stage height is and tells you what the flood elevation is. And I'm just like, I'm just going to check the hydrographs and just see if there really is a flood. I don't even know why I was thinking that, because I had kind of decided I was going to die in it and not really worry about it. And so I check, and there's, the Missouri River was flooded in one place. Baton Rouge, Louisiana. You know, a flood of trouble came there not too long after that. 
a literal flood came, like a monstrous flood, and then a flood of blood came to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The other was in Kansas City at a place called Napoleon. And God started to speak to me about why. Now, the truth is three days later, those rivers were blown out. Like, you didn't have to look for it. It was in, the, it was in every major headline that it was flooded. And it was flooded for about two weeks. But I had to die with him in it. Because we don't know what is good. We just don't. We don't even really know truth. That's why we can't know what is good. So we get in a conversation with him. We start listening to him. We start believing what he tells us. And then we look, is the word working in my life? Now, right now, I've got a word about June 1st, 2017. You guys all know it. I find all kinds of good language to kind of dance around. You don't have to believe it with me. I mean, how many times have I said this? But I believe it. Do you know why I believe it? Because it's changed everything about my life. It's worked. Has it worked in your life? Don't answer the question. Don't say it out loud. I'm not looking for encouragement. I'm not looking for an endorsement. I'm asking you a question. Has this word worked in your life? Has it changed the way that you see God and the way that you see yourself? And are you getting closer to him? And if it has, then that word is true. Now, it might not be accurate, but it is true. That means you got to respond to it somehow. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just asking you to ask the question, does the word that I'm believing, now I'm not just talking about the, you know, the thing that I said or whatever, the teaching that you're filling your heart with, is it working? The choices that you're making, the people that you're following, we're all following somebody. There's a, there's a huge sentiment in the world that is, I'm not following anyone. We're all following somebody. We, none of us originated any of this. This is a 2,000-year-old document in the New Testament, at least. There's no new ideas. We're all following someone else. In fact, Jesus prayed for his disciples, those 11 in that room. He said, I'm praying for everyone who's going to believe in me because of your words, not because of his words. Are the people that you're following, is their leading producing fruit in your life? Are you following in a way that is honing, is make, making the road more narrow, it's making the gate more narrow. Are you following in a way where you're honing out your own understanding of Jesus' leadership, or are you keeping the field wide open? I'm just willing to take in anything. Dangerous right now. You've got to start to decide for yourself. Not You don't follow a person like that. You'll bear their fruit. You don't want to do that. But you want to hone down what you're taking and what you're eating so that you're producing your own fruit in your own conversation with the Lord. Do you see what I'm saying? This requires effort. You're not going to accidentally do this. This means that you got to spend time like talking to Jesus, which is what you signed up for when you got saved, was talking to Jesus. But we're a body. We're a family. There's lots of parts. There's hands and there's feet and there's legs. And so we can't just talk to Jesus. We also have to figure out, we have to discern the body is the way that the Bible says it. Discern the body. If you discern the body, then you'll start to honor the body and you'll start to cooperate with the body and you'll start to reflect Jesus together. And the word that came out when, I, when we were during worship, the idea that our desire, if we really get what we want we're not taking it at the expense of someone else. If we don't take what we want, we're leaving some gap in some way in what Jesus wants. Because he made us, fashioned us individually. If you fully express the desire that he placed in you, fully under his leadership, you won't violate anyone else's dream. You won't take it from anyone else. That's the problem with the false prophets. They don't believe that. They think, I got to take as much as I can, otherwise someone else is going to take my place, and they start to build a pyramid. Jesus isn't like that. His is an upside-down pyramid. So if you picture a circle, just picture a circle. And maybe this will take some geomet geometrical understanding. I wish I had my little whiteboard, but I don't. But if we took a circle and it was all pyramids pointing in, would it make a nice, clean circle? No, there'd be a bunch of jagged edges on the inside pointing to Jesus. But if we turn those pyramids around and made a circle, would it be a solid circle? The triangles all pointed in? Sorry, I said, yeah, if they pointed in, it'd be good. If they pointed out, it'd be all jagged around the outside. We've got to be upside down pyramids. We've got to be people that funnel into the kingdom, not are trying to get our own spot. 
eke out where where's my spot and then i'm gonna start fighting everybody for it that's not the way jesus did it at all zero ways he said i make space for anyone who wants my spot i make space for them to stand right on top of it you see what i'm saying makes like a funnel this is what a true apostle does true apostle puts himself at the floor serves everybody he says my glory is that you this is what paul said my glory is that you do it not that i do it but someone will say you have faith and i have works. show me your faith without works and i'll show you my faith by my works you believe that there is one god you do well even the demons believe and tremble but you but do not but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Now remember, good versus evil. Just think about Abraham. Try to explain to anyone how what Abraham did with Isaac was good. You tied up your kid. You threw him on the pile of wood you're going to burn him on with a knife in your hand. You hauled him up the mountain. You threw him on it. He's asking you, Dad, what you doing? Is that good? It's God. It's his leadership. Fully obeyed, according to this passage. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Well, he knows what's in my heart. Well, what is in your heart? Is it producing something? Is it producing a work that somebody could see, that God could see? Justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar. Do you see that faith was working together with his works? He had to believe God was good and believing God was good gave him the space to actually do the thing God told him to do. I'm going to say it one more time. This is the way this, this is the only way it works. We have to believe God is good and that it's worth taking the risk that he knows what he's doing more than we do. Because there's a trail of destruction left in the path of the bride. That's why the whole world is going to blaspheme God because of her. And that's why Satan is going to make war with the saints for 42 months. Because she is leaving a mess that God calls good. And no one is going to see it from the outside. You see what I'm saying? So if we've got this like huge mixture in our understanding, well, you know, I just, I believe in the end, it's all going to work out. It's going to look good. It ain't going to look good. It ain't going to look good. And you got to decide that right now. I say this because I love you. Because a lot of people are going to choose their way right out of this. Because the pressure will be so great to quit because it looks so bad. Jesus, I mean, I'm not telling you anything new. Turn with me to John 16 for a second. I'm, 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 again, it's tragic that this message is so rare, but it is, and we just got to face that truth. It is tragic that this is not preached daily in the kingdom. Actually, go with me for a second to John 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but be, I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. They don't know good. Only one is good. That's the Father. They don't know him, so they don't know that I'm not good. They don't know that you're not good. But you are if you're under his leadership. If you're fully in him, you're the righteousness of God according to the Bible. Well, how fully in? As fully as you can be right now. Obeying him, knowing that if I trust that I could carry my kid tied up, bound, on the stack of wood, knowing that we're going to do something, because he told me we're going to do something that when I get there, it's good because it's him. This is hard. This is incredibly difficult. Do not water this down and symbolize it and say, well, that's, you know, yeah, theoretically that's true. How are you doing that tomorrow? How are you guys doing that in Chicago? How are you doing that at work? How am I going to do that when I get home today? What I say on social media, when I, what I say to people at work, what I say, like how am I saying what God is telling me to say? How am I doing what God is telling me to do? It's only, only going to happen in night and day prayer. Only going to happen in night and day prayer. And we could go on. This passage, I mean, he starts to say, these things I've spoken to you that you would not be made to stumble that they will put you out of synagogues. He's saying they're going to put you out of church. When he wrote this, to be a Christian was to actually choose Judaism, but with the Messiah. 
He's saying they're going to put you out of churches. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think he offers God service, capital G, not a false God. They're going to think they're offering Jehovah service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I've told you that when the time comes, you're living in the time, you may remember that I told you of them. So when somebody like me stands up and tells you this, Jesus already said it many times. Every writer of the New Testament said it. You're going to leave, if you stay loyal to him, a trail of destruction that is despisable by the world. Primarily starting in the church. Guaranteed. According to this passage, they're going to put you out of synagogues. It starts in the church. Is that what you're embracing? Is that what you're celebrating? He said, count it all joy when they persecute you. You're at the top of the mountain. You're at the bottom of the pyramid. Count it all joy. It's working. They really do think I'm evil like you, Jesus. It's a wonderful reality. Selfie of how much I'm hated. <laughs> we don't naturally embrace this. The flesh don't want it. We got to kill that part of the flesh. Last place. Turn with me to Revelation 12. I'm going to end every message, Lord willing, with some kind of victory. Revelation 12, verse 7. Now remember Daniel. He's like, I'm desperate for truth. Desperate for truth. I'm going to change what I'm eating. I'm going to change what I'm wearing. He didn't anoint himself for three whole weeks. Yeah, just, Daniel was a good-looking guy. Like, he's putting some stuff on his forehead, looking good. You know, he's high up in the government. King Nebuchadnezzar was like, I'm going to put everything under you, man. You've got it together. He's like, I'm taking all that off. I'm taking it all off. I'm desperate for truth. And angels started to move is the point. Revelation 12, verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. You know, if you think that the world is suffering a good versus evil clash, it's not. This is why. Satan, in a very cordial way, a very proper way, he appears before the Lord often. And God says, you, just, you were down there? Did you check out Job? You see how Job's doing? Yeah, I saw him. But, you know, you and I both know. You're giving him a little special favor. Let's touch it. Let's see what happens. Okay. Go ahead. Don't touch his body. This is happening night and day. According to this passage, day and night, the accuser of the brethren is before the throne. Satan wants access to this throne. This is not like, oh, when we see demons, we kill them. The angels kill them. It doesn't work like that at all. Satan's presenting himself to the throne all the time. This is important to get our minds wrapped around. Are you for us or them? No. I'm for you getting some truth. You getting alive. You getting real. You getting ready for a king of glory who rules with an out of Ryan, a rod of iron, uncompromised. He will not arbitrate with a man. He's not diplomatic. He's not, hey, you know... Let's try to see it from this guy's perspective. Can you guys kind of get along? I really want you in the kingdom. <laughs> He's not like that at all. He's like, make peace with me now while there's time. Because there's coming a moment when I'm going to kick out the usurper. And I'm going to do it when you start praying. When you start praying night and day, the night and day accusers got to go. He does not want to go. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his, his angels fought. They did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil, that deluded, arrogant being who shows up at God's throne and is like, let me tell you how it would work if you let me have my way. Gets kicked out. That great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a vo loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of the brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him. They, you, overcame him. 
by the blood of the lamb. Now, why does it say that? Why does it say you overcome the devil when it's Michael and his angels fighting? Same reason it said it with Daniel. Daniel, you started praying. I started moving. Truth started winning. That's the only way it works. You start praying, they start moving, truth starts coming down. We get clarity, we get awake, we get vibrant. We start seeing our own junk and we start saying, I want out. I want out. Do you want out? To stir yourself up, do you want out? Do you want out? They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Luke and uh, Katie, can you guys come back up? And... They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Now, there's a lot of people. I love Vicky's message last week talking about martyrdom. It's an important reality that we start thinking about. But it, the problem that when we start to think about it, that we got to we get in the narrow road because this is the issue. This is what Peter thought. I'm ready to die. But he wasn't ready to die that night. He wasn't ready to put himself aside and watch and pray with Jesus. He's claiming, I'm ready to die in a much more intense reality, but I'm not willing to die right now to a little bit of discomfort. I really feel tired, Jesus. You love me. I love you. You know my heart. Do you remember when he restored Peter? He asked him about his heart. Peter, do you love me? You know I love you. You know my heart. Feed my sheep. Work. Do something outward, expressing the inward desire for my leadership because I'm feeding sheep, Peter. And so, yeah, you say you love me, but are you doing my leadership? Because he, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. Now, it doesn't mean that we obey the commandments to prove that we love him at all. It means when I'm not doing the commandments, I got to say there's something broken in my love. There's something broken in my love. It's not working. It's not working. And the message of the false prophets, it's not working. It's not working. It's not producing more love. It's producing arrogance. It's producing greed. It's producing delusion, massive delusion. And they're going to try to kill you. You can't kill what's already dead. I already died to that. I died to it yesterday when I showed up at the prayer meeting. And I said the stuff that I didn't want to say. And I thought I was going to be boring, but it actually turned out pretty good. I'm going to go to the next one. And I'm not just going to be content to say the stuff that I said last time. I'm actually going to get a little bit more into this. Okay, what are you saying? What are you doing? Oh, that felt pretty good. He actually was saying something. He actually was doing something. Okay, tomorrow when I show up, I'm going to do like, I'm going to try to pray for somebody, see if they get healed. And I'm growing in my experience of who Jesus is. But if I just come here and put in my time, I'm deluded. It's not working. Stand with me, if you will. Oh, I guess you need that. Sorry. Can you re-secure it? Strong delusion is not something we have to be okay with. And there is fire available to us right now. But you got to reach for it. And I'm telling you, if you're able, whatever you're able to give him will not be wasted. If you can give him some motion. Hang on one sec. Isaiah 64. I'm just going to read this over you. Listen to the Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you start to speak to us right now? You meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. You are indeed angry, for we have sinned. In these ways, in these ways we continue, and we need to be saved. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is no one who calls on your name, who stirs himself up to take hold of you. For you've hidden your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are our potter. And all we, the work of your hands, do not be furious, Lord, nor remember iniquity forever. Indeed, please look, we are all your people. 
if we'll stir ourselves up and take hold of him, he is faithful to answer. So let's just respond to him right now. Just motion, something. Give him something to work with. You give him something to work with, he'll build his house. Holy Spirit, I'm asking all over the room, would you touch us, God, with the grace to stir ourselves up and take hold of him? There are more people in this room. I hear the Lord saying it right now. There are more people in this room that he prayed over in the upper room that night. They literally changed the world. And it didn't take that long. Within a few weeks, thousands were getting saved at a time. Thousands were getting saved at a time. If we'll stir ourselves up, if we'll take hold of him, if we'll stay awake with him, we won't sleep. We'll watch and pray with him. We'll get outside of our comfort zone. We'll give him something to work with. He's faithful to make something glorious out of it. Holy Spirit, all over the room, send fire where there's hearts open and wanting you. Any motion, any motion. Just wiggle your fingers if you want to. Move your feet. Just try to give him something, anything you can give him. He'll work with it. It's a righteous offering. Fire. Wind. God, release your glory. Release your glory. Release your might. Release your power. I pray that people feel you tangibly, encouraging them in their inner man. I speak strength to their inner man, strength to their physical frame. You are not weary. Stop telling yourself you're tired. You're proclaiming it over yourself. I don't believe in all the, you know, magic stuff. Just stop telling yourself a lot. He put you in motion from zero motion. He made you out of unseen things. Your first energy came directly from him and you hadn't even had a full night's sleep. Fire. You got to touch him. Fire. Glory. Light. You're just getting started. I say it over you. Hefzibah. Beautiful. Tears up. Lovely as tears up. You're just getting ready to get married right now. You are young. You are beautiful. You are powerful. And you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And you can do this. You can do this. You can be more righteous today than you were yesterday. And you can be more righteous tomorrow than you were today. And you're just going to do it by asking and receiving. It's the only way it works. Father, stir us up to ask. Open our mouths in Jesus' name. Tell him, I want my mouth open. Be like a baby bird. A baby bird, when it gets fed, it's, ah, 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 ah. its mouth is open. It's trying to get to the front. It's just trying to get what it can't get itself. Open our mouths, God. Open our mouths, God. Fire in this room. In Jesus' name.